HUD for a new way to look for axion dark matter and dark energy. And in fact, that dark energy part I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Uh, and this has worked with a, a bunch of collaborators, as I'll show you. In particular, I think I saw at least uh, Giannis on the line. So I'll, I'll be able to defer any really hard questions to Giannis, which is great. Um, uh, okay. So I actually want to start, though, um, by spending almost maybe the first half of the talk talking about some of the motivation for this experiment, in particular motivation for dark matter, but in particular also for dark energy. And so I want to discuss the cosmological constant problem, partly because it's motivation and it was why we started thinking about this experiment. And also just because I've been thinking about it a lot in general recently, uh, and I'm, I've been sort of obsessed with it recently, and I think it's exciting. Um, so I'll tell you just a little bit about that. And then kind of the second half of my talk, I'll move on and talk about our idea for using the, a storage ring as a detector for dark matter and dark energy. Um, if there's time at the end, I might mention this sort of last somewhat tangentially related topic also about supernovae and muons. Okay, so first the motivation. Uh, so dark matter and dark energy, of course, are uh, most of the content of the universe and, and people often call them some of the biggest mysteries in the universe. And, you know, I'd say that's clearly true for dark matter. We, we know actually, you know, it's, it's exciting that we know we don't know what dark matter is. In other words, we know it's not part of the standard model. That was a non-trivial result um, that was, you know, relatively recent. Uh, and in particular, we know it's something new beyond the standard model and um, it has some gigantic uh, uh, range. This, for example, shows you how many orders of magnitude the dark matter mass could vary over. So, so the dark matter mass might be as light as 10 to the minus 22 EV. It might be up here at the Planck scale or even beyond if it's you know, made of primordial black holes, for example. Um, so we really, we definitely know we don't know what dark matter is and there's many candidates. Um, WIMPs of course are famous and also axions. I'll be focusing more on the low mass end of this parameter space today um, on candidates that are axions or, or similar to axions, the so-called ultralight dark matter. So it's clear that dark matter is one of the biggest mysteries. Um, but for dark energy, I'd say actually the situation looks a little different. Um, in fact, for dark energy, uh, I, would, I would argue we have a default simplest microphysical theory that already fits all the data perfectly. <laughs> so you might say in some sense there is no mystery. Uh, in particular, that theory would be a, a cosmological constant, what I'll just call a, a CC to make it easier to say. Um, and by that, I just mean, okay, uh, you know, here's the action for Einstein, you know, gravity for general relativity. It's this Ricci scalar, and then I just add some constant. That's it. It's sort of the simplest thing it could be. Uh, in fact, normally you say, okay, if I add a field like an electron field or a quark field or something, it's going to interact with something else, right? The strong force, electromagnetism, something. But the cosmological constant is the thing that is sort of simplest of all. It interacts only with gravity. We know everything has to interact with gravity, at least we believe by the principle of equivalence. Um, but the cosmological constant, this, this background, if that is the dark energy density, this background energy density filling the universe, it has the simplest interactions it can possibly have, only talks to gravity. <laughs> Okay, so, so that's our, our simplest theory. And in fact, um, it fits extremely well. Sort of the definition of a cosmological constant would be something uh, like dark energy density that's exactly dead constant and never changes in time ever in the history of the universe. Uh, and in fact, we already know that the, we've, we've got measurements of the dark energy density going back you know, in cosmic time, back 10 billion years. And over the history of the, of the known universe over the last 10 billion years, we can measure that this dark energy density remain constant to a few percent. Uh, that's as constant as we know anything, any fundamental constant in nature. So for example, the fine structure constant in nature is one of the best known constants, uh, or, or rather I should say it's one of the constants that we're, we're, um, we've measured as precisely as, as possible that it's uh, constant for all time dark energy is as constant as that. We also know about the fine structure constant that it can't have changed more than a few percent in the last 10 billion years. Same with dark energy. Um, that's all this, this plot here on the right is showing. This W naught, if you're familiar with it, is the so-called dark energy equation of state. And if it's at minus one, uh, uh, that simply means that the dark energy density is not changing in time. And actually this WA is a parameterization of how the equation of state would change in time. So if it's at zero, 
if you're right at this origin point here, that simply means it's a, the dark energy is a cosmological constant um, and it's just not changing in time at all. <laughs> um, and you can see the error bars are quite small now. They're at the few percent level and they line up quite nicely uh, right around it being a cosmological constant. Okay, so we have this the simplest theory that fits all the data. Why do we talk about anything else? Why do we say, for example, why, why am I talking about this? Why am I interested in, in uh, looking for some kind of non-trivial dark energy and, and knowing what it is? Why do we talk about it as one of the biggest mysteries? Um, I'd say, uh, uh, in particular, you know, why the, basically the, the other option, if it's not going to be, the, the defining characteristic of a cosmological constant is that it doesn't change in time. If you're looking for anything else, any, anything but this simplest theory, the hallmark of it would be that it, or one hallmark would be that it does change in time. So why should I consider that? Why, why do people even think about that? People, I think, have um, a number of reasons. One of them is that, well, it's there. And since we haven't, you know, 100% proven it's constant, in fact, you can never do that. You can just lower those error bars. It's worth exploring. And that's certainly true. Um, but I'd say that it's more than that. In fact, you know, you could also ask the same question about the fine structure constant. You could say, well, look, I, I can look to see whether the fine structure constant chain, you know, the charge of the electron changes in the history of the universe. And th those are uh, interesting and worthwhile tests to do, but we don't have particularly strong motivation to think that they, it does change in the history of the universe. I would say by the dark energy, by contrast, we actually do have strong motivation to consider these more exotic possibilities. Um, and in particular, the reason is the cosmological constant problem. So what do I mean by the cosmological constant problem? I'd say actually there's some um, uh, disagreement <laughs> uh, among different theorists about exactly what this means, but, um, but I'll tell you the right answer now. Uh, but, um, but I'll tell you what, what I mean, um, what I think is interesting about it. We know that the energy density in the universe, I'm calling it a CC here, but whatever it is, the dark energy density is measured to be about milli EV to the fourth. That's how much energy density we have filling our universe today. But if you look at the laws of quantum field theory um, from these diagrams like this, where for example, maybe this is a top quark or, or something running in a loop and it's attached to a graviton here, you get a contribution. This, this, this gives a, a quantum quant contribution to the cosmological constant. And at the very least, it's of size TeV to the fourth. I say TeV because I'm relying there solely on the physics we already know. You know, we already know the standard model. We already know the fundamental laws of nature at energy scales up to at least around the TeV scale. So we, we know these loops are there. We know they're gravitating, things like that. Um, uh, and it turns out from, it's not obvious, but it turns out from these kind of quantum corrections that you get a bunch of different contributions to the cosmological constant. They're all of order TeV to the fourth. This is 60 orders of magnitude bigger than milli EV to the fourth, 10 to the 60 bigger. <laughs> uh, that's a lot. It's not a, um, it's not in direct contradiction in the sense that you get a bunch of these contributions. But what we know then is all these contributions must be canceling. The first 60 digits of them must all add up to zero somehow. Okay, they must all fine tune away. They must all cancel away to 60 digits and leave some tiny residual. And that's very weird because all of these contributions seem to come from totally different things. So there might be a top quark loop and there might be something to do with the muon, for example, and things like that. And it depends on couplings and, and things like that that are, see, uh, uh, you know, in the standard model have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> So you have these apparently unrelated numbers that are gigantic, but they manage to exactly cancel to 60 digits. While it's logically possible that that's just the way the world is, um, it makes a lot of us think that there's something new, that there's something we're missing, that there's something beyond the standard model. Um, uh, and in particular, I just wanna point out um, for my point of view, that the problem really is this, is why is the cosmological constant so small? not, um, some people have said the problem is why it, does it have a small positive value instead of being zero? Uh, I, would, I would disagree with that interpretation. The, um, the, the real problem I think is that it receives these contributions and, and has to be fine tuned away. We have no solution that would make it zero. Um, in particular, uh, decades of work, so this is often called the biggest problem in theoretical physics, 
And really, there have been decades when people have, have tried to think about why this should be so and what new physics this might be teaching us. And in the past, finding problems like this has really led us to discover a new, new physics, new pieces of the standard model and so on. But here, uh, really decades of thinking has not given us any known even possible solutions, <laughs> not even as something that works mathematically, let alone actually being true about the world. Um, so we have no reason to think that it should be zero, for example. Um, okay. And by the way, do please stop me anytime if you have any questions about this or, or objections or anything. Um, there are some uh, possible thoughts people have had, and I would, I would kind of class them into, into these couple of classes. So first, the, the kind of first thing that occurred to people, and, and people tried quite a lot as well, all right, maybe there's some problem with the calculation. Um, we know in the standard model you get these contributions, but maybe I can change physics somehow. Uh, maybe maybe change up these loop diagrams or do something that gets rid of this. Sorry. Oh, please. So, yes. Yeah. So I'm not at all familiar with this. So if, if, if you can tell me the graviton, this top block loop, if, if you use something like dimension regularization, what happens? Yeah, great question. So the um, uh, let, let me, in fact, let me first uh, uh, ask a different question, which is if I use a different kind of regulator, not dimensional regularization, um, if I just use like a hard cutoff or poly velars or something, which has a UV scale in it, then you would see that this loop goes proportional to that UV scale to the fourth. So it's actually cortically divergent. And when I put TV here, so really formally it would give you infinity and then I have to cut it off and I'm putting TV as the cutoff simply because I know there isn't supersymmetry or something else that would cut off these loops below that scale. I, I don't know what's above that scale, so this might be even higher. Um, uh, but at the very least, I know that I must, I must sum up, you know, I, I know these particles in the standard model exist with momenta, with energies below the TV scale. Electrons and protons and all that certainly exist and can have, you know, GeV <laughs> momenta and energies. So I've got to at least let those particles run in the loop there. And, and that's what this is saying. Dimensional regularization is, is always a little funny because that completely removes those divergences. You don't actually have divergences in dimensional regularization. Um, uh, so officially you just get those, those. Um, so, so, so the fact that it is quite uh, quartically divergent is because the graviton brings in some momentum in the interaction. Um, yeah, that's one way to say it. That's right, exactly. Or another way, this is, um, it's kind of a funny, the couple of concept is actually a little funny. Um, you can actually, some, the way most people will talk about it is that I'll actually delete this graviton line and I'll just make a vacuum loop here. Um, and then it's, it's quick to see that it's quartically divergent um, uh, because you're actually like just literally integrating up the, the vacuum energy contributions, the D to the fourth P or whatever. Okay, thank you. Yes, good. No, that, yeah, no, great. That's, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, uh, and, and I should say it's, um, it's a little, it's, you know, different regulators actually are a little complicated to see, but no matter what, you can see that um, uh, it, since we, let's say, you know, since we believe we know the physics up to these high energy scales, and, and certainly, for example, we believe something has to be happening at the quantum gravity scale, there has to be something going on there. We know our current theories break down. Um, you know there have to be these contributions um, to the to the cosmological constant. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. We're, yeah. Any other questions on this? Like I said, this is my main motivation. Something I've been very interested in recently. So <laughs> happy to happy to discuss it more. Great. So so one possible way is basically you try to remove these loop diagrams. And so for example, supersymmetry would do that. Or you could, you could potentially do it other ways. People have tried to invent other symmetries or other things that would cancel out these loop diagrams and explain why you don't get these big contributions. But you can, I'm not gonna prove it to you, but you can maybe believe that all of them require putting new particles at the scale at which I wanna cancel these loop diagrams. Basically, for this reason, actually, I was just saying about the cutoff, the standard model loops are, are true. We know the IR physics, the low energy physics of the standard model. So if I want to change something about the loop diagrams, I have to put something in right there at the milli EV scale to cut it off at the milli EV scale. If I don't do that, if I don't put something in until you know the TEV scale, then I'm going to get these contributions. That's what's so powerful about this argument that it's coming from IR known IR low energy physics. Um, well, we can't just go modifying you know 
physics at the milli. I can't just go putting new particles in or supersymmetry or something at the milli EV scale, right? We, we didn't even need colliders to probe that. We probed that a long time ago. So, so those solutions, which people try to spend a lot of time thinking about, it was just, that was the first, I mean, that was obviously going to be the problem from the beginning and no one ever got around that. It was, it was just too big a problem that we've essentially, we've already probed the scale of the cosmological constant. You know, when you need the LHC to probe the scale of the Higgs boson, we didn't need the LHC to probe the scale of the CC. That was sort of the first class, and, and that, I'm kind of telling you why that didn't work. And then the second class, I'm sure you've heard about people were driven, I would say, by, by this problem more than anything else. We're driven to think about anthropics in the multiverse. Um, I won't talk much more about that, but it is obviously very difficult to test. <laughs> so um, I would like it if there was a different solution. So instead, um, let me tell you why I'm motivated to think about this, that we think there maybe is a different solution. Um, it's certainly not proven yet that it even, uh, let's say, even mathematically works, let alone is it, is it true about nature. Um, but it's this uh, type of solution that is called dynamical relaxation and actually was first tried back in the 80s and then kind of abandoned, though, until recently. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you what it is in just one second, but before I do, I, I don't want to leave anyone with the wrong impression. So um, this is not yet even, um, this is something we theorists are still actively interested in. This is something I'm still thinking about a lot and, and working on a lot and definitely not um, established as for sure it would even work as a, as a solution to the cosmological constant problem. In particular, it requires doing some funny things to general relativity. Let me just put it that way. Um, evading these cosmic singularity theorems that were proven a couple decades ago. Um, uh, we proposed a way with, with two of my collaborators, Dave Kaplan and Sergey Rajendran, proposed a way using something called, vor that, uh, called vorticity in general relativity. Or um, people have also considered something called a null energy condition violation, basically a, a different funny form of stress energy. I, I'm not going to really explain that at all. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it if you're interested, but it's, um, I wasn't going to go into it. But I just wanted to say those are you know, um, by no means set yet. So this is still something we're actively thinking about. Um, but it looks promising as a solution to the cosmological constant problem. Okay, um, so what is it? What, is, what do I mean by dynamic relaxation? So the basic idea, which a couple of people wrote down, for example, um, we wrote down a, a model recently that we think actually um, could work. Um, so th these models in the 80s did have problems, part of why they were dropped for so long. Uh, there, there were things about them that definitely couldn't have been our universe. Um, the basic idea of dynamical relaxation, we call it dynamical, it just means uh, uh, I'm turning the CC from a constant into some dynamical variable. Uh, and in particular, if it's going to be a dynamical variable, that actually means it's going to be a slowly rolling scalar field, right? We know the, the laws of the universe are, are quantum field theory, at least at low energy. And so if this dark energy density is going to be changing in time, that's what I mean by it being dynamical, then it, it is a scalar field. That's just by definition. Um, and by relaxation, what is meant is that um, actually it's, I really like this as a solution. Um, I think it's sort of beautiful. You just accept the fine tuning. You just say, yeah, look, the laws of nature give you these big contributions to the CC. So the CC starts very big, but that's where it starts early on in the universe. And early on in the universe, I mean, let's say during very early, during a period of inflation, um, when certainly the CC could have been that big. In fact, that's often what happens during inflation. Um, but then if it's a scalar field, you see here this, I'm calling the scalar field phi, and I'm plotting a potential energy density for the scalar field. The scalar field can evolve. It can, it can roll down its potential, changing the, um, and this is a homogeneous value of the scalar field everywhere in the universe. So it just means changing the homogeneous energy density, what you would call the dark energy density everywhere in the universe. Um, that's actually also pretty natural. I and mean, that's what happens with scalar fields with potentials. That's how um, the theory of inflation works even. Um, but of course, so, so that's dynamical relaxation. That means all right, I start at some totally untuned value, some completely natural value, very reasonable, and then it just rolls. And it will at some point pass through zero. Uh, however, by itself, that doesn't do it, of course, because um, what we're saying is today we're sitting in some absurdly tiny region right around zero, right near this bullseye here. So how did we hit the bullseye so precisely? The theory of dynamic realization, this relaxation, the sort of magic about it, which I'm not, which I'm not really going to explain, but just, just so you can accept it, is that um, it actually, you, you uh, can, can actually pretty generically turn the zero point where the, where the energy density would pass through zero, turn that into a critical point of the theory. I won't really explain that other than to say, you know, having a negative 
dark energy density or, or cosmological constant would be pretty different than having a positive one. A positive one, that's what we see in our universe today, that's causing accelerated expansion in the universe. That's, that's ripping the universe apart. A negative CC tends to cause the universe to collapse. So zero, it's kind of natural for it to become a critical point. For there, there, it's a real change to the physics, a qualitative change to the physics on either side. I'm not really going to explain it more than that. I mean, unless you're interested, you know, I'm happy to talk about it more. But um, uh, uh, what's happening is we found a way to when the when the uh, when the energy density is very close to that critical point, something dramatic happens. And in particular, what dramatic happens is that we get the reheating, creating our observed universe. Okay. Um, and that's that's in in very brief the sort of the sort of broad strokes cartoon overview of of how this solution to the CC problem works. But in particular, I want to point out there's nothing special about about zero energy here. There's nothing special about the zero cosmological constant in the theory. That's how we evade the problems of the previous theories. There was no symmetry. I didn't have to put any physics in at this scale of the cosmological constant. That's how um, uh, it's not. This theory is not already ruled out, unlike uh, the other all the other tries to solve the CC problem. Okay. But in particular, then, so so why am I so I'm, I like I said I, I find this interesting because I, the CC problem is one of the biggest problems in theoretical physics. But in particular, of course, I'm most interested if we could test this. And the exciting thing about this solution uh, is that we can potentially test it. If it's going to be dynamical, it, most of the evolution, the most of the of the dropping of the CC from this large initial value to the tiny value it has today, most of that happens in the very early universe, and we're not going to see that. But if it is possible in the laws of nature for that to be happening, then it turns out it's still going to be happening a little bit today. There's going to be some little um, a remnant of that changing CC today. And so you are going to get a, a small change in the dark energy density today. This field is still going to have some dynamics. It's still going to be moving. Uh, and we can look for that. OK, um, uh, so that's a that's a prediction for um, uh, observables today. But I would say, in a sense, now, now of course, people know to look for that, and, and we make these cosmological observables, right? Um, uh, uh, the people who observe the CMB can map out, and they can even put constraints on, as we saw the plot earlier, they can put constraints on, on how rapidly the dark energy density is changing. Um, uh, but in fact, we can do something more, and that's, that's what got me, got us really excited that uh, in principle, once the dark energy density is changing, you could see it just in the dynamics of the universe, in, in the expansion rate of the universe changing. But if it is changing, there has to be something there. There has to be a field, uh, a quantum field that, that um, is causing that change. Who, that, that's the dynamics. That's what's behind that change. If there is, though, so long as it's not a pure CC, um, uh, then generically, it should couple to things that beyond gravity. It should have other couplings. In fact, uh, it would be difficult to forbid it from having other couplings. So you really would generically expect it to have some other couplings. They might be small, but they should be there, which means in addition to just seeing the effects of it in the expansion rate of the universe, I might be able to actually do direct detection of the dark energy. Direct detection meaning, you know, like literally here in this room, I've got the dark energy is, is filling this room, whatever it is, right? Um, if it's this kind of scalar field, uh, then potentially a very sensitive lab experiment could actually couple directly to it, not through gravity, but, but just directly couple to the dark energy. And you could feel some signal of the dark energy just in your uh, high precision experiment. So that's what got us excited. And I should pause for a second because that's kind of the, the key idea here. So let's see if there's any questions on this so far or objections or anything. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what can we do then? What can we look for? Well, actually, the nice thing is quantum field theory tells us there aren't too many possibilities. So I'm still calling this, um, this field, this dark energy field phi, and it can couple to photons here, F, or, or gluons, the strong force, electroweak force, whatever. Um, or it could couple direct to fermions. The psi could be protons or electrons or whatever. And this one over F for this little F, this curly F thing, it's just some very large energy scale, meaning this is some very weak coupling. So of course, we know it doesn't couple very strongly. Uh, it can't, and we would have seen it already. But it's pretty natural for these couplings to be very weak, to be suppressed by a very high energy scale. OK? These are just the, you write down all the couplings that are allowed by symmetries, allowed by the gauge symmetry and, and relativity and thing, you know, Lorentz symmetry and things like that. And, and these are basically the leading order ones. These are the ones to look for. Um, 
in fact, though, these are, these are, it's no surprise, these are actually very familiar uh, to, to a theorist because these are the axiom-like couplings. That's for a very good reason, essentially. Um, these are the couplings that, that are allowed for some field like this that is not otherwise charged under the standard model and is very light. So you would generically expect these to be present. And in fact, um, we can potentially design laboratory experiments to directly look for these, uh, uh, look for the effects of dark energy coupling to us through these couplings. That's actually very similar to looking for axion dark matter. Maybe not surprising because we're looking for it to have the same coupling. Essentially, it's the same laws of, of quantum field theory that would, that would give you the, the coupling. Um, uh, and in fact, so let me just quickly remind you or, or, or tell you how um, axion dark matter works, just a sort of uh, uh, brief overview. Um, uh, for the axion, the axion will be some very light mass particle. Here's showing you the rough mass range. And this is kind of a cartoon of the parameter space. This is showing you the strength of that coupling of the axion to us. And you'll notice all of these are suppressed by an energy scale far above the weak scale, which meaning they're much more weakly coupled even than you know, W and Z bosons and things like that. But the axion is much lighter. So we have a hope of, of seeing it in one of these experiments. And it has some current bounds, usually from astrophysics that are cutting off, uh, forcing you to have such a weak coupling. Um, and here you may have heard, I won't talk much about it in this talk, but you may have heard there's something called the QCD axion, which can solve this um, strong CP problem. That was one of the motivations for considering an axion. Um, but also I'll be focusing more on the um, lightest mass end of the possible dark matter. And, and here in this whole loud parameter space, the axion could be dark matter. And we just, we wouldn't know yet. We, we don't yet have good probes of that parameter space. And in fact, it's interesting because the left edge of this is the so-called, what's called the fuzzy dark matter. Um, uh, it's kind of fun if the mass of the axion or any dark matter particle is lighter than about 10 to the minus 22 EV, then it turns out it's de Broglie wavelength is so big, you can, you can check, it's de Broglie wavelength is so big that it's about the size of dwarf galaxies. <laughs> In fact, if it was any lighter, it's de Broglie wavelength would be too big and it couldn't even fit. It couldn't collapse and make the dwarf galaxies that we do see. So you wouldn't be able to make the, the large scale structure that we see in the universe out of dark matter. Uh, so that's ruled out to the left of this. That's why there's this edge here. Um, but also around this region called fuzzy dark matter, um, uh, it could have an observable effect on the large scale structure of the universe. And in fact, people have made some arguments that maybe we are seeing the effects of it. There are perhaps some anomalies um, that suggest we could be. Um, uh, it's a possibility. I don't want to make too much out of it, but certainly there's been a lot of interest in this region of parameter space. Um, and excitingly, that's the, the experiment that I'm, I'm getting to telling you about can probe this region of parameter space. Sorry. Please. Oh, you can't see the right side of the, in this picture. So what's the upper uh, bound and, uh, and, and what's the uh, coupling of that upper bound? I can't see. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, is it not coming through? So I, I plotted this up to 10 to the minus 2 EV in mass. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's, can you see my cursor now or? Yeah, well, no, it's okay. It's hidden by the, um, yep. Yeah. Oh, the zoom thingy? <laughs> it's hidden by, by you and me and others. Yes, so, yeah, you, you can right. collapse that actually if you want. Yeah, that's what I have to do. Oh, I see. <laughs> see my screen. Okay. So, so anyway, and what's the coupling at that point? So at that point, we don't know because it could be anything ranging from this, what's currently bounded, which is about um, suppressed by 10 to the nine Jev uh, scale all the way down to suppressed by M Planck. Um, uh, but for the, for the QCD axion in particular, that's where I cut it off there because that's where the QCD axion um, hits this largest coupling of 10 to the minus nine um, inverse GeV. Okay. Although I won't be talking too much about the QCD axion. Um, thank you. Good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, any, uh, any more questions? Please just interrupt. All right. Um, okay, so this is axion dark matter. So just to recap then, um, uh, here's what we're looking for, okay? We could be looking for dark energy, which is again, this slowly rolling scalar field with some potential, maybe kind of looking like this. And for the purpose of any lab experiment, um, you know, what's happening today or within any human lifetime, this thing is rolling so slowly. I mean, it hardly changes in the history of the last 10 billion years. So certainly I can, I can tailor expand it for any lab experiment today and say, okay, it's basically changing, you know, slowly, linearly in time like this. So when you think, when I tell you this scalar field A, you should just think some, some homogeneous scalar field with this equal value all across the universe, which is basically some constant plus some very slow change in time. Okay, and that's what, that would be the signal of this kind of dark energy that I'm uh, motivated to look for. 
dark matter, this kind of axiom dark matter that you may have heard about that, that uh, actually a lot of people have been, there's been a lot of uh, interest in recently and a lot of experiments designed to look for. Basically the way to think about that is again, it's some scalar field. Um, a, a massive axion would be described by a quadratic potential like this. Uh, and the scalar field would just oscillate back and forth. Um, again, it would be roughly homogeneous locally in our galaxy, but it would oscillate back and forth. Um, in this case, with a frequency equal to the mass of the axion, okay? Um, but, oh, sorry. Um, ah. <laughs> Not good at backing up here. Um, you can see that uh, if this frequency is low enough, which it is, I'm focusing on those lowest mass axions where the frequencies can actually be quite long, human timescales, you know, hours, weeks, months, even. Um, this cosine is not that different than this linear term, meaning that's why I can make an experiment that could look for both uh, dark matter and dark energy at the same time, if it's this kind of ultralight dark matter. Um, and just to give you a picture of what this kind of dark matter would look like, you know, when you think about dark matter, it's often talked about as wimps, which are individual little particles zipping around. Um, but when you're talking about such light particles, they are actually well overlapped within their de Broglie wavelength. And what that means, you should really think of them more as a coherent field. It's not individual particles, they're all sitting on top of each other. Um, and so there's some scalar field like this, or we even think about some vector fields, like some, uh, some new vector, like an electromagnetic field filling the galaxy. So this is this kind of dark matter that we're looking for. And you need a very different detector to look for it than you need to look for these heavy particles. Instead of a WIMP detector, you need some high precision detector to look for this kind of coherent field. And in particular, what you're looking for, um, as I was saying before, is, a, is an oscillating field whose frequency is equal to the mass. It's not, of course, it's not actually one single cosine like I wrote on the previous slide. It's got some, some width in, in frequency space. Uh, but the spike itself is very sharp. The, the spectrum is very sharp because it's spread only by the kinetic energy, which for the dark matter in our galaxy, the virial velocity is 10 to the minus three. And so it's just a 10 to the minus six uh, width line. So it's a very narrow line. And that's the, that's the signal of axion dark matter that we're looking for. Okay. So um, uh, let's see. Good. Yeah, as I promised, um, I spent a, a while on the motivation. So that's, that's what we're looking for. Now let me tell you, maybe for the rest of the talk, about our proposal, how to use uh, storage rings to go looking for that, to detect it. And I should um, say a uh, big thank you to my collaborators, um, Sergene and, and Dave are theorists like me, but we owe a, a big debt of gratitude to our uh, experimental collaborators, uh, Giannis and Janabek and Selchuk, who um, uh, are the ones who actually do the, you know, the real work, <laughs> the hard work. It's very impressive what can be done uh, with storage rings. Uh, and and um, we're certainly relying heavily on, uh, on their expertise. And of course, um, you know, they'll, they'll be the ones to, uh, to make this actually all work. <laughs> and I'll also happily defer um, any technical questions on this to Giannis. Okay, so what are we looking for then? Well, um, as I said, actually, I, I noticed I've changed notation a little bit. I'm calling the field A now, sorry, and, and um, uh, I'm looking for it coupling uh, like this. So there's some coupling constant, just the strength of the coupling, and then this is the axion field that I'm looking for, and it's coupling to the proton in this way. This is the relativistic Lagrangian, but actually a little easier to read and more useful is just to take the non-relativistic limit of this, in which case it gives a term in the Hamiltonian, which should actually look pretty familiar. This is what axions do, okay? They couple to the spin of the proton through, you know, it's the gradient, the spatial gradient of the axion field, of the scalar field that's, that's filling the universe, either dark matter or dark energy, um, which couples to the spin of the proton. And you can see this just looks um, exactly like the coupling of a magnetic field to the proton, right? <laughs> so you have this uh, gradient, spatial gradient of the axion field, which couples to the proton spin in the same way as if it was a hidden magnetic field. Of course, it doesn't couple to charges or anything. It doesn't, it doesn't actually look like a real magnetic field, but it couples to a proton spin in the same way. What does this do? Um, this is something that is often called the axion wind effect. Uh, what this means is the spatial gradient to the axion field is the, also the momentum of the axion field. So if it's the axion dark matter, for example, that I'm talking about, um, if I were to measure the spatial gradient to the axion field right here locally, it is the direction the axion dark matter is going. Um, uh, that is, um, so, so you can see this points in the direction of momentum of the axion, sort of the direction of the axion wind, the wind of the axion, if you like. And then you can see what it's going to do. It's going to cause the proton spin to precess around that direction of the axion. So you won't see it. There'll be some hidden direction right here in your lab, 
um, whatever way the axion is blowing today, uh, and the proton spin will be processing around that. Uh, and there are now um, uh, multiple, people, several people have, have created experiments. We proposed uh, several experiments also um, looking for this axion wind effect. For example, using high precision atomic magnetometers, atomic clock type technology, um, torsion balances, uh, several high precision experiments looking for this. Um, and of course, what you're going to see in some experiment like that, so let's imagine I have something like a torsion balance, which is basically sort of like a compass needle, uh, looking for this, this um, precession effect. Well, there's some spatial gradient to the axion locally. That will, turns out that'll be proportional to the square root of whatever the um, energy density of the axion is, say either the dark matter or dark energy density, times this velocity, because I said it has to be proportional to the momentum of the axion. Well, if I'm looking for dark matter, let's say people use these torsion balances to look for dark matter. Um, uh, I'm looking for this dark matter energy density. You can see that gets this big um, factor of a thousand suppression to the effect from the velocity. You know, it's a, it's um, a V, oh, I should, <laughs> sorry, I should have said being a theorist, I always set C to one. So my, my velocity here is a big suppression. It's a V over C suppression, a 10 to the minus three um, suppression. Um, and for dark energy, you might say the situation looks even worse. Uh, the velocity is zero. The dark energy is not going anywhere, right? <laughs> um, of course, that's in the cosmic rest frame. That's in the rest frame of the universe, but the Earth is moving with respect to the rest frame also at about 10 to the minus three, this, this virial velocity of the galaxy. So there is at least some, um, so, so in our frame, it looks like the dark energy density is moving. So there is some velocity, but still it's a pretty big suppression. Right, um, and that certainly hurt all of these um, experiments, these high precision experiments that were going to look for the axion this way. Uh, but of course, so uh, you know, I can't uh, take an atomic clock or a, a torsion balance and uh, you know accelerate it up to relativistic speeds, throw it at the wall or something. Uh, that that wouldn't work very well. Um, but you know, when we started thinking about this, we said, boy, it sure would be nice if we didn't have to pay this factor of a thousand. That makes a really big difference. Um, that would really help. Uh, we remembered uh, some uh, so the very nice work that um, uh, we had been hearing about. Actually, I had heard a talk from Giannis many years ago about the um, uh, proton storage ring, and, and uh, that had gotten me excited many years ago. Realized there, there is a precision experiment that occurs at relativistic speeds, of course. Uh, as we know, we can accelerate individual particles to relativistic speeds. And uh, to do a high precision experiment, we want to want to keep these protons around for as long as possible to build up this axion effect. So the, the effect of the axion, I said it's a very weak coupling, which means it's going to be a very, very small effect. So I'm going to want to integrate it for as much as possible. So of course, I want to use a storage ring. Um, but uh, there's sort of an immediate problem. So if I want to send the particle around in a circle instead of a straight line, uh, then you can see that um, uh, even if I don't have dark matter, even if I just have a constant axion um, wind, let's say from dark energy, then the direction of the spatial gradient, the, the, the uh, direction that the proton would see as it, as it whips around, uh, keeps changing, keeps, keeps circling around 2 pi. And so this um, precession effect would rapidly average to zero as the proton goes around in a circle. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, famously, <laughs> that problem was already solved beautifully um, by the ability to freeze the uh, proton spin sigma here in relation, the angle of it in relation to the proton's momentum as it goes around the ring. Um, so uh, as, as I imagine um, you're all aware, uh, the, um, uh, if, I, if I arrange the ring correctly, then I can make sure that the proton spin precesses at the same rate that the proton's momentum uh, rotates as it goes around the ring. So maintaining a constant angle between them then crucially, if I do that right now, imagine let me jump to the frame of the proton, the rest frame of the proton. I shouldn't have had this beta here, sorry. But if I jump to the rest frame of the proton, and then you see, imagine I had this even completely homogeneous, not moving anywhere axion background field. Well, if the proton is moving uh, in the storage ring at some relativistic speed, then when I jump to the rest frame of the proton, that looks like the background scalar field, the axion field is moving at me, at the proton, um, at this relativistic speed. And so I do pick up some very big spatial gradient. I do pick up some very big um, spatial momentum of the axion. And then, of course, the idea is, all right, I can just put the protons in the ring 
um, you know, what I should say, <laughs> for, from a, uh, being a theorist, the, the simple cartoon <laughs> um, is I can just put the protons in the ring, have them, have them sit there, go around um, as long as possible, and their spin will keep recessing around this same direction, uh, and the signal will keep adding up because the spin is always in the same relation to this gradient of the axion field. And then, of course, I would just try to um, read out the precession rate of that proton spin as precisely as possible. Um, okay, so let me pause there. That's, that's actually kind of the main idea. I mean, have, I have some more details and some results of sensitivities and things like that, but actually this is the main thing that I wanted to get across um, in this talk, which is the signal and, and why we're looking for it. So let me pause there and um, see if there are any questions or, or objections or anything. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> then let me just go into a little bit more detail. Um, in particular, first, let's say, all right, let's think a little bit more about how this experiment is going to work um, and uh, what we're going to see. So first, in the cosmic rest frame, or, or let's, let's even imagine that's the, it doesn't matter that the Earth is moving at 10 to minus 3. That's now a tiny effect compared to the velocity of the proton. So let's just imagine um, the storage ring is at rest relative to, say, the dark energy or the dark matter. Um, uh, in the cosmic rest frame, the... Um, uh, effect actually goes proportional to this four, this uh, uh, d mu, this four derivative of the axion field. But in that rest frame, it's all in the zero component. Um, and if you notice, so it's roughly, let's say, given by the, the amount of dark energy density in the universe. But if you notice, there's also some fraction here. As I said, um, the dark energy has to actually be dynamic. It has to be changing in time. It has to have some kinetic energy, as we call it, um, in order to have this effect. Um, but there is, a, and crucially though, the important thing is the zero here. Um, if I'm in the cosmic rest frame, there is no spatial momentum the axion field is not going anywhere, right? The dark energy density is not moving in some particular direction. However, if I jump to the protons frame, then of course I just Lorenz boost this four vector. Uh, and so crucially, I do pick up a non-zero and quite large uh, spatial component to this uh, gradient of the axion of the scalar field. And in particular here, you can see it's proportional to this velocity. Um, so this velocity is gonna be one, we're not gonna get a suppression, which is crucial. That's, that's the main point. That's what we wanted out of the storage ring. <clears throat> In that case, then, just as I was showing you, then the, the, um, uh, this, this will be the spatial gradient to the axion field. I'll just plug that in here, and that will tell me the size of this uh, sort of effective, quote unquote, magnetic field. Okay, and that'll tell me the size of the effect. Um, one thing which, which um, uh, uh, we realized, uh, which wasn't immediately obvious to us, was that, of course, uh, you can't just plug in this answer here. This seems to have a gamma in it. So in principle, if you boost it up to a very high boost factor, maybe you get some big um, enhancement. But you can't, of course, uh, because this, is, this uh, was written here in the proton's rest frame. Uh, so if I have, let's say, a fixed amount of time, I can hold the, the protons in the storage ring. I have to pay a time dilation factor to go to the proton's rest frame. So I lose that gamma. I think that was immediately obvious to uh, <laughs> our experimental collaborators who wondered why we were making such a big deal out of it. But, um, but in particular, though, what I've accomplished by this is I've lost that velocity suppression that is there in every other high precision experiment. So by being able to do a storage ring uh, experiment with, with, with relativistic particles, I was able to improve the size of my signal by like 10 to the 3. That was automatically a very big win <laughs> over you know, these, let's say, atomic physics type techniques, for example. Of course, they just have different systematics and things like that, but it was, that was the reason we were excited about this um, technique. Um, uh, and then I, I was talking about um, uh, axion dark matter, but actually it turns out um, no matter what the spin of the dark matter particle is, when it's at those light masses, uh, we can look for it with this technique. Okay, and I, I won't go into that more unless, unless someone's interested in that, some, some other details, but um, so even if it's a vector, for example, not a scalar, we can still look for it with this technique. It requires some modifications of how you do it, which is interesting. Um, uh, but the nice thing is we can really probe almost any kind of dark matter at these very light masses. So this is a, a very general experiment looking for um, dark energy and dark matter. And as I said, if, if, it, if you do have this kind of dark energy or this kind of dark matter, it, it should have these kind of couplings. Okay. Um, I'll say I probably don't need to go over uh, this slide, um, but, but uh, this is just a quick recap of, of the uh, frozen spin method for keeping the, um, uh, you know, if I, if I choose, for example, if I'm in an all-electric ring and I choose the protons to be at the magic momentum, 
uh, then their spin stays in the same orientation with respect to uh, their momentum. So I just need to choose, with respect to their, yeah, their momentum vector. So I just need to choose the correct uh, momentum for the protons, for example. We won't necessarily, we won't only consider an all electric ring, but just as an example. Okay, so then the crucial point is this, this sort of uh, uh, cartoon sketch of the experiment I've been building up, you can see actually really relies on basically exactly the same or very similar hardware to the proton storage ring EDM proposal. Okay, and of course then we're relying on all the um, uh, amazing work that's gone into thinking about that experiment and, and on just storage rings in general, all the built up knowledge and, and machinery and everything. Um, uh, so in particular, I, I won't describe this much and, and uh, defer any questions to Giannis, but um, roughly the idea is, as I was laying out, use a, uh, use a proton storage ring. We'll want to use two counter-propagating beams, just like in the EDM proposal, to cancel out many backgrounds, for example, associated with um, uh, spurious magnetic fields. Um, to tell you, and, and here's some uh, example parameters we used uh, to, make our, to make our estimates. Uh, but in particular, let me, let me point out some of the key parameters setting the sensitivity of this experiment um, are we'll assume that protons spend about a thousand uh, seconds in the ring. We'll assume we can store them for about a thousand seconds. Uh, and we'll assume that total after, after many uh, runs of this, we can put through about 10 to the 12 protons through this experiment. And you can see that then gives us, uh, uh, well, the shot noise limit on that sensitivity then would be about 10 to the minus nine uh, radians per second. We'd be sensitive to about that level of um, uh, spin precession rate for the proton. So if the axion, either dark matter or dark energy, was causing even that uh, small a precession rate for your protons uh, in, in, the, um, in the storage ring, then we would be able to see it. So this will be, be what sets the sensitivity level. And then I'll just go plug this parameter into those formulas I was showing you on previous slides to see um, how sensitive we are to axion dark matter and dark energy. And I won't talk much about it, but of course, um, a crucial question is all the uh, systematics, all the backgrounds for this. Uh, luckily, we were able to rely heavily on uh, all the thinking that's gone in the storage ring EDM experiment. Oh, sorry, something I should have said. Let's see if I've got it here. Um, uh, let me back up one. Uh, You'll, you'll notice that um, here, this, uh, the, the, the cartoon sketch I've drawn is actually, this is the um, uh, correct orientation we want. Let me back up one more. This is the correct orientation we want for the spin of the proton with respect to its velocity. We want it um, pointing radially here. That's different than the proton storage ring EDM, or that's different than, than uh, the direction you use to look for the signal of, an, of a proton EDM. Um, we want, you can see we want it pointing radially though, because the, um, the direction of the spatial gradient of the axion field, let's say in the proton's rest frame, uh, is along the velocity that, that had to be, that comes from the boost to the proton's rest frame. And so I need a spin pointing perpendicular to that so it can actually precess around it. If the spin pointed along that direction, of course, uh, it wouldn't precess and we, we wouldn't get any signal. So in this case, I want to orient the spin uh, perpendicular to the velocity um, differently than in the uh, uh, proton storage ring EDM experiment. Or I should say, would, one would probably do that in the proton storage ring EDM experiment as well, but that is the signal channel for our, for our uh, measurement. Okay, then there's a lot of backgrounds. They actually are somewhat different because of the different signal, the different um, characteristics of the signal we're looking for, but luckily we could still use a lot of the same um, uh, simulation technology and everything, the thinking that had been built up so let me, I won't go through these uh, completely, um, but let me just mention a couple of the worst ones. For example, a non-planar orbit for the protons around the ring uh, uh, can be a nasty background for this and, and look like our effect. Uh, but luckily we can, we can uh, uh, minimize it because um, if, we, if we keep the uh, um, a vertical position of the protons stabilized, uh, that will naturally uh, reduce this um, uh, background effect. Uh, and similarly, uh, uh, some spurious uh, magnetic field uh, absolutely can look like a um, look like this effect. In fact, the axion, as we said, uh, points um, longitudinally along the direction of the, the axion field looks like a magnetic field that points along the direction of the proton's velocity. Uh, luckily, however, you'll notice that the um, counterpropagating beams that you have uh, the signal is different in the two counterpropagating beams because the axion signal 
uh, is proportional to the velocity, right? So if I flip the velocity of the proton, the, the axion itself is not giving a direction. It's the velocity of the proton that's picking out a direction in our experiment. So if I flip the velocity of the proton, then I flip the signal. I flip the effective magnetic field, which is of course not true of a real magnetic field. It's not coming from the proton, the background magnetic field. Um, and in particular, um, we, here you see our, our specifications down at the bottom. We think we need uh, to measure the beam position, the, the, really the splitting between the two counterpropagating beams to about 100 nanometers, uh, which my, my experimental colleagues tell me, um, I, I certainly couldn't, uh, couldn't claim this is easy, but they tell me no problem uh, to achieve that with these squid-based uh, beam position monitors, which have been shown to have sensitivity at the uh, 10 nanometer per root hertz level. So it should be easily enough to measure. Uh, this splitting between the beams. Um, uh, similarly, the, we'll want to shield um, external magnetic fields. You can see below about 100 nanotesla and, and keep the um, azimuthal harmonics low. Um, and that, we believe, should, should reduce these backgrounds um, to the level that we need uh, to achieve our, our desired sensitivity. OK, so that was all I was going to say about backgrounds, um, unless anyone has questions about that. <laughs> Um, let me just move on and end by showing you our um, projections for the sensitivity of such an experiment. So here again is this axion uh, parameter space I was showing you before, now a little bit more specifically, not a cartoon. This is the coupling of the axion to nucleons, like the protons, the strength of that coupling. Um, this is the mass of the axion or the frequency of the axion. Um, and you can see here the astrophysical limits, which actually come from emission by neutron stars and supernova 1987A, and they rule out um, axions that are coupled too strongly to the standard model. But any, any coupling down here in the white area is allowed, and, and the axion, uh, this is, I should say, sorry, this is for axion dark matter. Uh, the axion dark matter, the dark matter absolutely could be in this region. And here you see this um, fuzzy dark matter uh, region of um, particular interest to many people. Um, and the really exciting thing, this, this solid blue line shows the sensitivity of this proton storage ring experiment that I was telling you about. And you can see it goes, what, some three orders of magnitude past current bounds over um, many orders of magnitude in mass range for the axion. And in particular, uh, uh, covering the fuzzy dark matter region. And in fact, in this lowest mass range for the axion, uh, this is one of the most sensitive experiments uh, proposed. Okay, <laughs> so I think this is, this is one of the, one of the um, uh, most exciting experiments for this uh, axion mass range. Um, this uh, corner frequency that you see here uh, comes from the assumed storage time of a thousand seconds in the ring. If you were to make, if you were to assume the storage time was shorter, for example, the uh, corner frequency would move up and you would have a higher um, base level for the sensitivity. You have a worse sensitivity across all these low masses. If it were to get longer, you would extrapolate this diagonal line and you'd, do, you'd have better sensitivity at these lowest axion masses. Um, what's happening at the higher frequencies, why is this line rising like this? Um, and, and I should say at the lowest frequencies, of course, that's because the more time you have to integrate this signal up, this procession up, the better you do. But at the higher um, dark matter masses, the higher axion masses, uh, what's actually happening is the axion dark matter itself, the, the signal is oscillating many times during this um, uh, storage time of the proton in the ring. Um, and so then, of course, um, in the, the way I presented the experiment so far, you would just lose signal. You, there, it doesn't help if the axion oscillates back and forth around fully around 2 pi a few times. Um, that all cancels out fully and you're sort of left, if you like, with a, with a one uncanceled part of a period. And that's why this uh, sensitivity curve rises like this. Um, but that also suggests to you that you can do better than that. Um, so when the axion period is shorter than 1,000 seconds, you can make what we call a resonant version of this experiment, which is basically choosing a slight um, detuning of uh, the proton from the magic momentum so that it, its spin actually does precess relative to its velocity. Whatever um, relative uh, precession frequency you choose for the proton, however fast it's precessing relative to its velocity, that will be the um, frequency uh, at which you are most sensitive to the axion, okay? Um, because then the proton spin would actually be changing in sync with the, um, with the effect that you're looking for, with the axion signal that you're looking for. Uh, and then what this dashed line is, of course, that only picks out a particular, like any resonant experiment, that picks out a particular frequency you want to look for. Um, we don't know where the axion mass is, of course. If we did, <laughs> it would be a lot easier to find. 
So we have to sweep that. Actually, this is, this is true of many different axon experiments. They're often resonant. Um, we have to sweep the resonant frequency. So what this dashed line is, is it's um, assuming a, a log uniform prior. So saying, oh, I, I spend the same amount of time per log frequency interval um, sweeping the resonant frequency of the experiment um, across these different possible axion masses. Okay, so that is our um, sensitivity to axion dark matter. And um, what excites me about this is, as I said, this is one of the most sensitive experiments for this axion dark matter candidate, one of the um, really kind of uh, favored and, and popular candidates right now that people are building many experiments for um, in, this, in this lightest mass range. Uh, Peter, um, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you say detune the energy, how far you are going to detune the energy? Ah, good. So what you need, let me, let me take do an example. So for example, um, let's say I wanted to look for a like 10 to the minus 16 EV axion, which is kind of, well, let's call it around 10 to the minus two Hertz in frequency. Um, then I need to choose, I need the proton um, to process, the proton spin to process relative to its um, uh, velocity at that uh, 10 to the minus two Hertz frequency. Um, uh, so it's not, so 10 to the minus two Hertz, that's a hundred second period. So that's a pretty small, um, at that mass, for example, that's a pretty small, like the proton is going around the ring, um, uh, many times, obviously in a hundred seconds. And mm -hmm. I only want its, uh, spin to process relative to its velocity once go around two pi in a hundred seconds. So it's, I, so I would say it's a very small detuning. Um, is, was that what you were asking? Was that the question or? Uh, yes. So basically, you are saying it's in a very small deviation from the magic energy, basically. Is that what you mean? Exactly. That's right. That's right. If, if, if you got to, it depends to some extent on the frequency. So if you had to go to very high frequencies, uh, you, you might need a bigger variation. But you can see we run out of sensitivity anyway, unless you were going to do funny things like really just sit at that frequency, unless you had some reason to sit up there. So, so I think overall, the frequencies that we're really interested in, exactly, it would be some very small, very slight detuning. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm told that's possible. Now, being a theorist, I'm not going <laughs> to um, uh, possible to control it. And notice, you want to control that at a at a reasonably precise level, so you can sit on that resonant frequency. Um, but yeah, good. No, thank you. Great, great question. Are there other are there other questions on this? This is kind of our main result here. So let me pause for a second. Okay, great. And then. Um, Finally, also, uh, let me just show you, this is our um, projected sensitivity to dark energy. Um, I plotted it a little differently now. This is the strength of the coupling. Um, and again, these gray regions are ruled out um, by axion experiments, or this, this gray region um, is ruled out by cosmological measurements, um, uh, uh, CMB measurements and things like that, looking for um, uh, the equation of state of dark energy. So I plotted it versus here, the equation of state parameter W, and remember, minus one, that's where it's a pure cosmological constant. It is not changing in time at all. And you can see, of course, if it's not changing at all, that's not, there's nothing to look for. It's, uh, it couples only to gravity. And sure enough, look, our, our sensitivity curve spikes up to, to nothing. We have no sensitivity there because we can't, we can't look for it there. It's just a CC. But so long as it's a little bit different, you know, several percent different than um, a cosmological constant, changing just a little bit in the whole entire history of the universe, uh, we can actually be quite sensitive to it. And notice you can, you can in principle, it's, it's really sort of a different parameter space, but you can get far beyond the, what the, um, the equation of state limits that are coming from uh, uh, cosmological measurements like CMB measurements using this uh, storage ring to look for this, to directly detect the effect of this changing dark energy instead of indirectly seeing its effect on, on the universe. Um, now, it's not, you can see, of course, we don't go as far uh, beyond the allowed couplings as for dark matter. And that also makes sense. That's because the dark energy density, the, the dark matter has clumped locally in our galaxy. So we have a lot more of it right here than you have at an average spot in the universe than the average density, whereas the dark energy density doesn't clump. And so it's about 10 to the five times smaller than the dark matter density. So that always makes it harder to look for dark energy than dark matter. But I would say this experiment, the, the, the proton storage ring experiment, being one of the most sensitive experiments for the axion, for the low mass axion dark matter, is, uh, I, I believe it's still true, it's the only experiment even proposed that I know about that could possibly directly detect um, dark energy in, the, in this kind of dark energy um, and, and get past any of the current bounds in the coupling. So already that was, to me, very exciting. 
Um, uh, and, and hopefully this even inspires you know, future work and, and, and more improvements to, to even probe further into this dark energy parameter space, uh, because I think it's very interesting. Um, by the way, one thing to keep in mind, both for this plot and the previous plot that I was showing, are that I'm plotting and coupling. You, you may have often seen, for example, people talk about WIMP direct detection experiments in terms of um, uh, the cross section of the dark matter interacting with a standard model. Um, uh, note that cross section is coupling squared. So if I was plotting this, for example, in cross section, we would have be going six orders of magnitude past the current bounds. <laughs> or the dark energy experiment would be going one or even more than one order of magnitude past current bounds. So already that's still, that's still pretty good. And, and there really could be the new physics, either the dark matter or the dark energy um, hiding in there. Okay, and then uh, let me, I think I'm, yep, just about out of time. So let me just summarize. Um, so, so we were pretty excited about this um, possibility of using the proton storage ring. I think it shows real promise as a very sensitive detector for axion dark matter in the lowest mass range and uh, also, also dark energy. And you're really winning from the fact that this is essentially the only high precision experiment that is done at relativistic speeds <laughs> with respect to the cosmic rest frame. Um, and excitingly, this also includes the, the sort of um, uh, interesting target of fuzzy dark matter. And it can even begin probing this dynamical dark energy um, beyond current bounds, which is something um, none of the other experiments can do. Uh, and it's, um, I would say, also it, in a sense, comes for free. Uh, you know, you're, if you're, if if hopefully we build this proton EDM experiment anyway, because it's also extremely well motivated to look for the proton EDM. Um, but you also get the ability to look for uh, dark matter and dark energy. So thank you. Thank you very much. Peter, for the wonderful presentation. Are there any questions to Peter? Could I, could I ask a question? Yeah, I can. Please, please. I was yeah. going to defer questions to you, Yanis. <laughs> hi. hi, Peter. Uh, as usual, you gave an amazing talk. Thank you Thank very you. much. Um, I, the question that just occurred to me, is this dark uh, energy density constant throughout? Could we hit a bump uh, or something? Uh, you, you mean constant spatially? Is that what you mean? Yeah, spatially, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, so it, once it has, if it's a pure CC, it also has to be dead constant spatially, absolutely. But, but once it's a scalar field, it absolutely has dynamics and it can clump. Um, okay. in, in fact, it likely will have, in, in fact, it, ha it won't it can never be perfectly constant. It will have to have some spatial inhomogeneities. Um, but they will be um, quite small, small meaning much less than order one. So you could... Okay see ripples in it, but not, um, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get a large enhancement to the signal or something, if that's what you're, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Although, by the way, actually, it's a great question because it's not something I've thought about a lot uh, because it's a little small, but, but in, in principle, you know, I mean, if, if, you know, being a theorist, if you let me dream crazy, if, if we do, if you guys do detect this, um, uh, actually measuring things like that. So, so you'd want to measure the rate it's changing and also seeing things like spatial and homogeneities actually starts to teach you a lot about the microphysics of it, which would be really cool. I mean, you, you could learn a lot about the physics, of course, not surprisingly when you detect it, but, but that would be one of the ways. So. <laughs> yeah, great. It's a great question. Yes. Uh, so I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, first is that, that the, uh, the theory question on, the, on that uh, graviton top loop. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you said that if you had... Uh, Susie, then it, from the usual arguments, uh, there will be a cancellation. Did I understand you correctly? Uh, yep, that's correct. That's right. Supersymmetry would actually have solved the CC problem if it only could have been at a milli EV. <laughs> yes. And the second thing is that about the EDM. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, um, the, the, what sort of, you know, I remember from Yanis's talks before. Uh, you can get EDM bounds to perhaps 10 to the minus 29 or something. I mean, um, like, uh, I mean, how do the two, two, two things go together, looking for the dark energy and uh, EDM? When you say that one, one says that one can get around 10 to the minus 29, does that cover a lot of ground for the dark energy or not? Um, yeah, great question. It's it's the same. Let me go to that slide. It's it's the same parameters we're assuming as for the um, uh, for the here's the slide. So it's the same parameters we're assuming as for the proton storage ring EDM experiment. 
So, so that's right. And in fact, it, it, the way I like to say it, I'm, I'm sure it's in reality a little more complicated, but the way I like to say it is, look, you know, uh, uh, just, just have the proton storage ring collaboration run, do some runs with the um, proton spin radial <laughs> in the perpendicular direction. Actually, I'm sure that would have been done anyway for background reasons. Um, uh, but, but essentially that same data channel that would have been there already in, in the same hardware, um, uh, it's that same, those same numbers we're assuming that would give you that proton EDM sensitivity gives you um, this good sensitivity to dark matter and dark energy. Yeah. Okay. And, and maybe you can let me ask you one more thing. What mm -hmm. if we one uses electron storage rings? Ah, good. Hold on. Let me see if I have a, um, did I make a backup slide? No, I did not. Darn. Um, yeah, great. So, so maybe actually, actually even defer that question to Giannis, but in principle, absolutely. So the Axion, let me just go back to my theory slide. Um, the Axion absolutely has the same form of coupling in, in principle should to the electron. There's, um, there's nothing that forbids this coupling to either protons or electrons. And it, in fact, the way it arises from, from UV, from high energy physics, you would expect it to even be around the same level, probably not exactly the same number out front, but the same order of magnitude because it's all coming, it, it's basically set by the, the scale of the high energy scale from which the axion arises, the PQ breaking scale as we call it. So absolutely, you'd expect the exact same spin precession effect to be there for electrons, um, uh, but we would, we would then want a similar sensitivity. So, so maybe actually, I don't know, Giannis, if you want to comment on electrons or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah this, is, Bill. this is Bill. Yeah, the electron would be great, but um, at the magic energy, there's no polarimetry. So we looked at that extensively and you just, you can't do the magic, uh, magic energy with the electron. Perfect, thank you, yeah. That's what I would say. Yes, exactly, yeah. Great. May I ask thank a you. question? Uh, yeah, congratulations. Uh, you are an amazing speaker. Uh, you even uh, gave me the illusion that I understood your talk. Congratulations. But I have a, a, I'm a little bit confused. I thought the axion was related to something else like CP. Now I see the axion going into the dark matter. Can you make any comment about it? Absolutely. Yeah. And let me go actually, let me go back to my little cartoon here. Um, uh, so um, the, yeah, absolutely. That's right. So the, the axion was first invented as a solution to the strong CP problem. You know, that's, this is going back to the, to the 80s, um, uh, to Peche and Quinn and Weinberg and Wilczek. Um, uh, and the, the strong CP problem being that um, essentially we should have already seen a proton EDM a long time ago, right? Because uh, there should have been more CP violation. We, we thought there should have been more CP violation than there is. And that is actually another one of the famous fine tunings of the standard model just like the CC problem is. So that's another big problem. I didn't mention it today, but I'm, I, I take that very seriously and, and spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and that's a very good motivation for an axion. Uh, and that's this thing that we um, call the QCD axion. So yeah, sorry, we, we, some, we, we mix up words. Uh, the theorists do a lot, but I'll, I try to be consistent. And, and if it's gonna solve the strong CP problem, I call it the QCD axion. And um, it turns out to do that, essentially, you need to sit in this stripe of parameter space, okay? It, that's not at all obvious. Um, let me see if I can think of something to say about that. So um, the, uh, it, it, that would come from the axion coupling to QCD in the right way to solve this um, strong CP problem. And then that, that, turns out, that turns out to whatever the strength of the coupling is that gives the axion a mass. So that, that puts the axion on this diagonal line. Um, yeah, let me, let me sort of leave it at that. But so, so that is one kind of axion and, and I personally have spent a lot of time thinking of ways to go after it. It's, it's highly motivated for sure. Um, but it turns out when people started thinking about it more, actually there was even more motivation for it. So, so first they proposed it as a solution to the strong CP problem. Then they realized actually, wait a second, this axion is an excellent dark matter candidate. <laughs> Um, and then they also realized how easy it is to get because actually all I mean by the word axion, so people sometimes mean different, more complicated things. All we usually mean, all I mean, and all theorists really mean is a pseudo Goldstone boson. Okay, that's it. Something that comes from breaking of a symmetry at high energies. I see. Breaking of a symmetry is pretty darn common and, and, and pretty easy therefore to get these light particles. 
Um, in fact, when you try to write down UV theories, like string theories and stuff, you often get lots of them. <laughs> it's sort of hard to avoid, actually. Um, so, so we generalize. So, so we say, okay, the QC accent was motivated by a solution to the strong CP problem. But, but here I'm saying, and, and what some of this new theory work is saying, you know what, actually these, these um, uh, uh, actually not, dark, not even dark matter, but much lighter axions would be motivated as solutions to the cosmological constant problem, for example. Okay, thank you. So that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's definitely something that gets talked about a lot. And, and um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are other experiments looking over here, for sure. Um, uh, our, our, this, the storage ring one is looking over here, but, but definitely there's a lot of good experiments looking over here too, and those are great. And they're, they're pretty complementary actually. If you wanna look for the axion, you kinda wanna divide it up and look in different mass ranges. Um, different experiments are good in different mass ranges. And, and I would say this is the storage ring one is a really good one in this low mass range. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, definitely. I didn't, I didn't address that at all. <laughs> There's certainly a lot more to say about axions. Any other questions? Yes, if I, if I may. Um, actually, I was wondering, but in order to reach the ultimate sensitivity in this experiment, at least mm -hmm. the, the uh, non-resonant part, uh, the, uh, the question is how much you can increase this 1,000 seconds that you can have in principle. And I was wondering uh, how, how can we, you know, how far can we go, or at least can we dream that we can go, uh, you know, from 1,000 seconds to what? And actually, if you increase it, uh, say, factor of two, how, how uh, far down do you go in the coupling? Excellent question. Yeah. And let me go to first, let me actually address your second question, um, which is the precession time. You basically just multiply this Hamiltonian term times time times the precession times the times the storage time. So it's just this energy times time tells you the amount of radians precessed. Um, so you can see it's linear in the coupling. If you make a factor of two increase in storage time, you win factor of two in your sensitivity to the coupling, which is great. <laughs> in fact, that, that's four in cross section, the way when people like to plot it. So, so even a factor of two is great, absolutely. Um, uh, and for the other part of your question, great question. I also have that question a lot and I keep bugging my experimental colleagues. So let's, let's put them on the spot. Uh, Giannis or someone, do you, wanna, do you wanna answer if you think you can improve this? Um, definitely the spin coherence time is, uh, we are thinking of new things, but we, we can only propose what we believe we can do now. So <laughs> that's the, uh, right. Uh, once we have an experiment, I believe will improve all of those. This is a great question, Nick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Yes, I also always had that question. <laughs> Kept saying, hey, could you do a little better? <laughs> All right, then looks like there are no more questions. So thank you so much for presenting this wonderful talk. And um, my kind request is uh, if you can email those slides, either Haising or me, that would be kind of great. We'll post that on our website. And thank you once again for all the attendees and the speaker. Happy Halloween and have a great weekend as well.